Welcome back to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, a.k.a. The Doctor, in studio with my partner in crime, the intrepid Mr. Scott Burns. Hey now, your co-conspirator. Co-conspirator, and uh, Benny's in the house with us. And uh, before we get started, just want to remind everyone to please uh, spread the word. Please follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Please check out our YouTube channel. And uh, we're really growing the audience. We're getting more subs, more followers. And a lot of that has to do with your support and you spreading the word and helping this go viral. So we, we appreciate that. Like, subscribe, share. Yeah, please do. It's a, It makes a big difference. And uh, we got a big, big uh, Gambino episode today. But before we get into that, Related to social media, um, our sister p- publication, if you will say, <laughs> a Gangster Report, uh, Scott wants to uh, mention something, uh, an update on Gangster Report. Yeah, so for people that have followed me, uh, you know, since I started my career and have been um, consuming my Gangster Report web magazine uh, over the last eight, nine years, uh, I made a pretty... Important decision um, that was, it, it took me a long time, <laughs> probably too long, to uh, decide that I had to, for the sake of the content, for the sake of the audience, for the sake of me, I really had to change from a ad revenue um, business blueprint to a paywall site. Uh, it just, everybody was losing out. Um, and it might be harder for, for people that now have to pay for the site to understand that, but I hope they would, uh, realize that, you know, I got bills to pay. I got a family I got to spend time with. Um, I was giving away really, really, um, exclusive select content for nine years for free. And all I'm asking right now is a dollar a week. And you're going to get more content than you've gotten over the last eight or nine years. And you're going to get more diverse content. So um, before you were getting roughly, I'd say, five articles a week. Now you're definitely going to get seven to eight articles a week, if not more, um, as well as a lot more bells and whistles. And, you know, uh, it was an end of an era, and I really enjoyed doing it when it was kind of a, um, a community free for all, but now I'm kind of creating my own little, uh, you know, gangster report clubhouse for anybody that wants to come in and kind of let me lead story time. <laughs> I am, uh, I'm honored and privileged and I just hope people, uh, will understand that it, it's really, when you break it down, if you're someone that consumes it on a regular basis, I'm literally asking for a dollar a week for what turns out to be, you know, uh, an article plus a day. Yeah, it seems like it wasn't just wasn't sustainable to keep it because it was open access for a long time, which was very which was awesome, and I people like me appreciated that. But I I, I agree with you. It seems like it's it's not sustainable over the long term, and so I think it's um, a bargain. You know, hopefully people will uh, take you up on that because and just, it's really good content. And just for people to you know to contextualize it, one one final note here, you know, someone said to me like. Uh, well, you know, it was someone online was complaining about it and I, I was having a, a civil conversation with them and I was like, what you don't understand is it's either this or I shut the site down. Right. It's not like I, I, I can't sustain it the way it's been going the last eight or nine years. So it's either go to a paywall and invite people to come in for a dollar a week and continue it and, and grow it and make it better or just say goodbye and say it was a good eight and a half years, and and now I'm turning the lights off. So yeah. that's what it came down to. So please check it out, and, and hopefully, um, uh, you know, I think it's a bargain. Hopefully people will will continue to support it. Um, so speaking of, of Gangster Report, uh, you've, you've done some reporting recently on uh, the Gambino family in New York in general, and in particular, Lorenzo Menino. And um, so this is one of my favorite topics. I like to talk about these transatlantic, transatlantic connections between Sicilian mafiosi and Italian American mafiosi. He's one of these guys who's at the nexus of that transatlantic. Um, so why don't you, if you want to start with some of the 
particulars of your your specific reporting, and then we'll launch into a more general yeah. conversation well, about get, the Sicilian the Sicilian mafiosi in the United States. Let's give credit where credit is due. I mean, a lot of the initial reporting here was done by Jerry Capace at Gangland News. Um, he has been reporting on uh, organized crime, corruption within the construction industry. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been there forever. It'll probably be there um, forever. And um, right now there is a, a Serbian gangster organized crime associate by the name of Mike Michael or Michael Michael, um, who is a target of a major, major racketeering case. He's, uh, I believe he's been indicted and it involves, you know, him running all of the Gambino's construction rackets. And even though Lorenzo Menino, who right now is for the last uh, three, four years has been considered the, at the very least the acting boss or the street boss, of of the Gambino crime family, uh, since the um, murder of, of Frankie Boy Cali in 2018, I believe it was either 18 or 19. I can double check in a second. Um, but they represent the the Sicilian wing of the Gambino crime family that really started to take power in the 1970s with the arrival of the the Cherry Hill Gambinos, and since around 2011. The Sicilian faction of the Gambinos are the shot callers in that organization, and they control the administration. And the Gotti regime, which lasted from 1985 um, until the, the 2000s when um, you know Peter, who was John's brother and one of his successors, ended up uh, stepping down, and, and, and Italian Dom Cefalu, Frankie Boy Cali, Lorenzo Menino. Um, originally came up under Sammy the Bull, Jackie the Nose D'Amico. These are all names if you follow the John Gotti story that you recognize, Mikey uh, Scars Di Leonardo. But uh, now um, they're the ones that have the power. So Jerry has been reporting on that racketeering case within the construction business and this Mike Michael and how he's connected to the Gambinos. And although Lorenzo Menino has not been indicted, according to Jerry Capace's sources, he is a prime target of a federal racketeering investigation into construction racketeering that I'm guessing is either a companion investigation to the Mike Michael investigation, or it is the Mike Michael investigation. And there could be a potential, um, uh, um, I'm, I'm blinking on a term on, on, on another indictment, uh, a superseding indictment. Um, when, when I should know this, I'm the crime reporter, but sometimes there'll be an indictment that lands. And then before trial, there'll be, three more indictments that land within that indictment. And I'm blanking on the term right now. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but uh, so, so it's either that Menino is the target of a, a separate investigation or he is going to be or could be indicted in, in the Mike Michael case. Um, and they've got wiretaps and this guy was, uh, meaning Mike Michael was employing Menino through one of his construction companies that was kind of like a uh, a shell company. Uh, I think it was something. It was called something Rebar. I'm blanking on the name right now. Uh, and we know for a fact that over like a two year, I'm trying to think of the not. I apologize. I left my notes at home before I uh, came to the recording. It's it's negligence on my part, but I, I believe that 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 Menino has taken something like uh, four hundred thousand dollars from this company in the la over like a two year period, and that there was a twenty thousand dollar bonus that was given to him in the Christmas uh, Christmas twenty twenty, and that there's a wiretap of Mike Michael talking to Lorenzo Menino about that $20,000 bonus and telling him to be sure to report it on your taxes. Yeah. So Menino, he, he's considered an employee of that? He's considered a consultant, I guess, but yeah. the 
federal government claims it's a, a no-show job. Right. He's on the payroll getting paid a six-figure salary for not doing anything, according to the government. Yeah, I mean, we were, um, we've had a guest on in the past, um, Jack Garcia, who was known as, uh, he had infiltrated the Gambinos as Jack Falcone, and we're going to have him on again, I think, pretty soon. But he he said to us one time that, in his opinion, not an ounce of concrete gets poured or a, or a nail gets hammered in New York City without the Italian mafia getting getting its cut. And, and, and I suspect that, that some of that's hyperbole, but the point is well taken that if you think that the, the Italian mafia is completely um, out of the sanitation business and the construction business— and I, I've heard that even the garment industry, there's still a presence, an OC presence. But when it's so deeply embedded, even if you've cleansed, let's say, the majority of the corruption, yeah. I, if it's been there, it's so rooted and has been there for 100 years, it's hard to get that that house, that proverbial house spotless. There's always going to be little corners of it that, are corrupted and, and in a city like New York yeah. with a with a, so a, huge. a an, uh, an area where you have five crime families not counting what's going on in New Jersey not counting on what's going on in New England um you, you just you, the, the numbers the percentages go up that that you're gonna have some level of corruption it's just like with the teamsters like the teamsters as a general rule are are nowhere in the galaxy of the corruption that existed under Jimmy Hoffa, but that doesn't say that that doesn't mean that within the uh, Teamsters orbit that there's not some form of labor racketeering going on I- yeah. anywhere. I can't. Those are my labor brothers and sisters. Right. I can't. I can't I won't comment on that. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, and if you think about the how the how enormous commerce is in new york city this is what this is what i think is interesting about the scale people maybe don't think about is it seems like when you read the newspapers that mafia guys are going to prison every day and there's no mafia left actually if you look at it from a numbers perspective the mafia still has the advantage the FBI does not have the resources. To, no, their when resources. You think of all the nooks and crannies and all the commerce in New York City. You think federal law enforcement has the resources? To, so yeah, they get some big guys and they they've taken people down. And I get it, it's not 1950 anymore. But if you think that they could they could get into all the nooks and crannies of commerce in New York City and clean out all that corruption, come on, they've, they're it's not re- possible. The federal government's resources. I mean, this is a a narrative and a and a and a, and a truth. That ha- has permeated for the last twenty years. That that, that resources have been depleted since nine eleven. There's been yeah. a, a distinct shift towards priority in the federal government, even more so since Donald Trump took power. And this is not a a political uh, uh, edit- editorial, whether you pro Donald Trump or anti Donald Trump. But the fact is, there's been a increase in uh, domestic uh, uh, terrorism. And and issues on the home front in terms of uh, far right wing and far left wing um, craziness. I don't know, I don't know about that. <laughs> but uh, and, you, my point is that the the resources of the government in terms of going after organized crime were already depleted, and then you add in the climate of our country in the last six years plus, and and those resources are are spread even thinner. Yeah, I mean, I I. I wonder if um, and it's complicated. I, I don't know if the feds are. I think I think in some ways the feds are underappreciating domestic well just he- terrorism. Just here in Michigan, where Jimmy and I are based out of, we had a a, a situation where there was a, a a plot by a militia here, a far right wing militia here, to kidnap and kill the governor of our state, Gretchen yeah. Whitmer. Um, and even that gets and that was d- because. There were a lot of informants. There's were right. So, Out of like the twenty two conspirators, yeah. like fourteen of them were informants. Yeah, it, it, it so then that gets that that becomes complicated too. So um I mean I, I would say that I would just say that uh there's no question since nine eleven that a lot of resources have shifted toward counterterrorism. I would 
take issue a little bit with you and say most of it is toward international terrorism. Mm-hmm. But but either way, whatever, it's not it's not toward organized crime, not even in New York City, where they used to have each crime family had would have their own unit, unit, had their own OC unit of the right. FBI. And I believe of the DEA as well. Yeah, that's so not you the had case anymore. Two, you had a, and maybe even the IRS. So you might have had three separate federal entities investigating all five families within each organization. So you had five different teams in the IRS investigating the five families, five units within the FBI investigating the five families, same with the DEA, uh, all trying to make cases that could intertwine, maybe didn't intertwine, but uh, I I think there there was a, um, everybody's on the same team. This is a a priority. I mean, especially after uh, uh, Hoover died, and, you know, yes. uh, uh, Jagger There's Hoover shift, from yeah. the 20s into the early 70s, there was not a ton of federal law enforcement muscle put behind going after the mob. When Hoover died, that all changed. The floodgates opened up. Uh, it was a trickle in the 70s. And then it was a, a, a you know, the dam broke in the 80s. But uh, that's an interesting contrast because under Hoover, it was the opposite. Hoover was obsessed with. Domestic political groups, yeah. including to the extent of violating their constitutional rights. And he was a really, a really bad guy. Um, I think if you care about civil liberties and, mm-hmm. and civil rights, he was a really bad guy. And he said, there is no mafia. Remember? And Well, I think he was compromised. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's right. That's, a, that's another interesting aspect of it is um, he wasn't ignorant and um, he wasn't stupid. I think he he very well knew there was. A so, he had, mafia. So, he had, so he had all this attention for a good twenty five years, and and that attention had a lot of or uh, that scrutiny, that microscope that was put on them by the federal government yielded massive gains for the government, sure. reap big benefits. Yeah. I, I mean, every almost every crime family was decimated by indictments, decimated by informants, ripple effects that are still being felt today. But the fact of the matter is, in the last 20 years, whether or not the mafia has shrank, and we know it has in numbers, but if the people that are chasing the mafia has also shrank, mm-hmm. then you're, you know, you're, on an, you're back on an even playing field. Yeah. And, and I think that uh, the guys that are left are in those industries where there's not as much scrutiny. Part of it is because they don't have the resources, but also part of it is guys have learned the lessons that, you know, if you're going to be whacking people left and right, if you're going to be real flashy, then eventually you are going to get someone's attention in law enforcement. But if you stay low key, um, I mean, the FBI, when they think that there's a, a crisis with terrorism, whether it's international, domestic, you got a border crisis, all these things, you think they want to spend who knows amount of money infiltrating some construction racket or some bookmaking scheme in New York City? Somebody in the FBI probably does, but they prioritize, right? And and it shifts towards other things. So if you can just stay low key and not make, you know, not leave bodies in the streets, in some ways you're going to be left alone by, by federal and, law And if we're talking about the FBI and those five OC units that have now uh, consolidated into a one or one and a half. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's bandwidth. Yes. You're right. just not going to be yes. able to accomplish what you accomplished. Um, when you have 10 people working or 20 people working five families in one unit, um, as opposed to, you know, all those other agencies working on task force, uh, or, you know, a multi-agency task force, and, uh, you know, you had, you know, each unit would have 25 guys in it. Now the, you know, each one of the five units in the FBI going after one of the, uh, each five families had 25 guys in it. Now the entire unit has 25 guys in it and they're going after, do the math for me. <laughs> You're going after five times the, uh, of, of the, uh, the amount of, uh, people. And uh, if that makes sense, I'm sorry. I've never been good at math. And I think, uh. Also, if you if to the extent that there are resources toward organized crime, uh, the cartels are yeah. increasingly take up more of that, um, more of their. You're talking about bandwidth, like so. In terms of, if you're going to devote manpower towards something, um, and then and then I would say also like, um, 
a lot of the attention still seems to go toward street gangs, and uh, I have my own theory on that. I mean, I, like I don't know if we want to get into that, but I, and I and I also <laughs> just think it's it's. It's easier for them. It's easier for them to make cases against make the gangster cases. disciples. Yes, than, I mean there. The I mean I'm tracking it. Mafia. I mean there are cases against gangster disciples. Yeah. Uh, I mean this is a group that's uh, based in Chicago, but has you know subunits and satellites all around the country. I mean you do a just put a Google alert on your phone. Um, you know there's every couple of weeks there's another bust of a gangster disciple. Yeah, and I think those in those in in that case you have a group that's almost well for the most part. Involved in drug trafficking, they they, they are involved yeah. in other things, but mo- for the most part, drug trafficking. They're very violent, and they're not insulated, like the Italian mafia is, is insulated with their political connections, their social connections. You have the cartels, which basically it's state capture. I mean, they basically have an entire government <laughs> in Mexico, so it's a lot more challenging to build a case against the like the cartels or the Italian mafia when they have when they're insulated and and have a lot of power, as opposed to making cases against um, medium-sized drug dealers in the yeah. inner city. And and then and it's good headlines. It makes Congress happy. Oh, we're arresting all these people. We're, I'm, I'm not saying just, you know, that in some cases these street gangs aren't dangerous. I, I understand it. They're- but, but we deal with this all the time when you're, you know, again, put it, put it into context, mafia, the mob, La Cosa Nostra, the the John Gottis of the world, L- the Lorenzo Maninos of the world are romanticized. Yeah. They're not to the to the person watching NBC News where Lester Holt gets on and tells you about the Gambino bust in New York, and they show four eighty five year old Italian men being paraded in a perp walk. Th- that doesn't scare no Joe and Jane American citizen watching NBC News in Lincoln, Nebraska. But when you parade 10 gangster disciples... All tatted out. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> what's going to move the needle for the voters? Yeah, no, it's a great, no, it's a great point. It, you, you're going to score more points yeah. with uh, domestic politics, with busting scary inner city uh, you know, gang members. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that um, I think in, a terms to, in terms of organized crime right now, the federal government... Like you said, they're looking at the cartels, um, and I think they're really looking at more recently the bikers because there's been so much instability, um, you know, in in the biker landscape, and we've dealt with that in the past, and we'll dealt with we'll deal with that going forward in 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 our OG podcast. But let's do a little deep dive on Lorenzo Menino and kind of tell people who this guy is, where he came from. I didn't realize um, that. He was connected to a murder in 1988 and uh, that Menino early in his career, I knew he was connected to the Cherry Hill Gambinos. I guess I didn't pay close enough attention to until uh, until maybe Frankie Cali died or was murdered. Um, the connections that Cali and Menino, who uh, are, I guess, middle aged or. At yeah. the end of the, the top end of middle age, well, Frankie Boy Cali's dead now, but uh, in his early sixties uh, is Frankie, or sorry, is Menino Lorenzo is. Menino is sixty four right now. But uh, until Frankie Boy Cali died, uh, I didn't realize Frankie Boy and and Menino had pretty direct and deep ties into John Gotti and the John Gotti regime. Yeah, I mean, my research indicates that that um, Jackie the Nose D'Amico was sort of the um the nexus point between the Gotti's and the and the Sicilian guys. Because I know Gotti, um, we know from wiretaps that he he was always kind of circumspect about the about the Sicilians. He didn't like that they all were speaking in, in Italian all the time. And he, he made that one funny thing about how like uh they understand English until it's time to kick up. Then all of a sudden they don't understand. They don't understand English. And um but um and and it's it's interesting uh that that Gotti used to have to to, to show you the weight that the Sicilian faction carried that when Gotti was the boss 
when he had to meet with John Gambino, Gotti went to him. He went to New Jersey. Right, whereas, whereas Gotti was always famous for holding court. With John Gambino, Gotti would have to go visit him, which is interesting because, first of all, Gotti's ego. But second of all, John Gambino was a captain. He, was, he wasn't even a part of the administration. But, but, but he knew, Gotti knew that John Gambino carried a lot of weight because of his connections back to uh, Palermo. So, Jimmy, why don't we... I'm going to hand it to you to tell the listeners, like, let's trace it back to the early 70s or mid 70s when the three Gambino brothers uh, that became to be known as the Cherry Hill Gambinos, you know, kind of like a, a, a tidal wave, if you will, that lands on the shores and, uh, you know, there's destruction <laughs> in its wake from kind of the moment that it hits. These guys landed uh, in. Uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, at the very end of Carlo Gambino's reign. They were his cousins. Yes. And he kind of places them as a kind of like a family within a family. Yeah, their their father. So you have the three Cherry Hill Gambinos, uh, Giovanni, who we call John, and Rosario, and then uh, Giuseppe, who we call Joe Gambino. But those are the three the three big ones. But there's there's actually a lot of cousins other uh, several other cousin, cousins, Manny Gambino, um, Erasmo Gambino, uh, Antonino Gambino, and others. Um, there was Francesco Gambino, the one they called Cheech, but I'm not sure exactly how close he was related to the, these other Gambinos. But um, anyhow, if you look at the three main brothers, their father and Carlo Gambino were cousins going back to Palermo. So when they come to the United States— Carlo pulls some strings for them, uh, gets them set up with uh, different businesses. And um, so they uh, were very close with Carlo's brother. Carlo's brother, Paolo Gambino, who was a captain, was sort of like the unofficial head of these new zips that were coming in to. And they placed uh, him. Tommaso Buschetto was one of those guys that came in. He wasn't with the. Gambino's back in Sicily, but he knew them and he was uh, Amici with them. Here's what's interesting geographically is that it, they placed them in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is a suburb of Philadelphia. Right. I mean, it, you're 10 minutes from Philadelphia in Cherry Hill. So you were putting them smack dab in the middle of Bruno crime family territory. Right. Which speaks to the relationship between Angelo Bruno and Carlo Gambino in the 1970s. And it also foreshadowed some of the animosities that led to <laughs> Angelo Bruno being murdered in 1980 and then Castellano, uh, who was Carlo's uh, brother-in-law and um, successor, you know, his famous murder in, in 85, which allowed Gotti to take power. Yeah, so um, we've talked about that with some of our Philly episodes, but because Carlo was close with Angelo... The Gambinos are allowed to set up shop in their territory, which, as you pointed out, under other circumstances, a Don, it, you know, in their territory may have viewed that as um, encroachment. But the, Bruno was gave the green light to that. And then to add insult to injury, as you mentioned in another episode, especially toward the end of his life, Angela Bruno was aloof with the rank and file. But... He would hold court with the Cherry Hill Gambinos all the time. And take envelopes. to dinner with them. And take, take envelopes. envelopes from them. Have Christmas, like ho spend the holidays together. But he'd call it's his all own. It's documented. But he'd call his own soldiers on the carpet for dealing drugs. Yes, right. Because he right. thought that was bringing them heat, which he was worried was going to turn into them flipping on him. But he would take money from the Cherry Hill Gambinos that, that were drug money. You know, one of his closest advisors at that time was Long John Monterano, who was the, you know, the... Um, the meth kingpin of America yeah, yeah, right. uh, in, in his uh, mob heyday. And he, and he was, um, so there's a lot of hypocrisy, but also Bruno was allowing the Cherry Hill Gambinos to open up restaurants and bars throughout Philadelphia, Atlantic city. And, um, you know, in that world, some of the Italian American guys view this as a zero sum game. Like if if the Cherry Hill Gambinos are opening up construction companies and bars and restaurants, that means that I'm I'm not right. I'm I'm losing out, and these guys are are pushing age and making a lot of money. 
Um, so there was a lot of resentment toward um, toward Bruno, but it's it's really fascinating because it gets wound up in all these other aspects of of mafia politics because um, the Gambinos are part of it gets confusing. They're part of a mafia super clan, and what I mean by that is genealogically, not necessarily an organization. Because they're spread out among different organizations in Sicily, and then in, and then in New York, you could even, if you want to say Los Angeles, mm-hmm. with, if there's if that's even a thing today the, with Tommy Gambino. The, the Tommy rumor, Gambino. the rumor is that one of the Cherry Hill Gambino's sons was sent out to L.A. Well, that's not a rumor. He was sent out to yeah, L.A. The right. rumor is that he's the boss of the L.A. Mafia. Yeah, right. whatever, whatever's left. So, but but the clan itself is Gambino, Inzerillo, Spatola. And DiMaggio. And part of that clan includes Carlo Gambino, Paul Castellano. They're all, if you look at a family tree of this, it's very wide and it's so interconnected. And these families all intermarried with each other. In some cases, they they married each other's cousins. Like in some cases, G- oh, Gambino but, married another Gambino. You no, know, Carlo Gambino married, I believe Carlo Gambino, I believe Carlo Gambino's wife was his first his cousin. First, his first, right, not yeah. his fourth. Yeah. Third cousin. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, mob archaeologists yeah. out there. That uh, we love. Shout out to the mob archaeologist uh, podcast. Oh yeah, yeah, right on. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Glad, I'm glad you uh, you mentioned that. Um, we'll figure out a, a point where we can like collaborate with them on their show and, and our show. But um, so they're very powerful, and the the different families are uh, they're members of other crime organizations like the Gambino crime family in New York different crime families in the Palermo area. So they have a lot of clout and they're very much involved in drug trafficking by the 1970s and and early 80s. And there's a shift in mafia politics in Sicily happening around the same time where the power is shifting away from Palermo and those, those clans that I'm talking about toward Corleone. Especially Totorina, but all his guys, Provenzano, Bagarella, those guys, and it, a war breaks out. It's it's called the Second Great Mafia War, and which is it's it's actually a, not a really the best way to, to describe it because it's really a massacre. The Corleonese didn't lose any; they didn't lose anybody. All the casualties the, it was were on the, the other side. It was in the late seventies, early eighties, yeah. and you had yeah. hundreds of bodies. Oh yeah, it was very. It was. Nothing's on par with the cartels, but if you were talking about the Italian mafia, that would be as close as closest yeah. thing you could you could where they were killing prosecutors, judges, uh, as well as other mafia members, and it was a real massacre. And Corleone, they were at war with almost all the old school families, which included this super clan of DiMaggio, Inzerillo, Gambino, Spatola, and um, they're getting they're they're killing them. And this gets complicated because, remember, a lot of those relatives are in New Jersey and in New York and either full membership in the Gambino crime family in New York or at least associated with the Gambino. So Paul Castellano has to intervene at one point and and put, sends the word, sends John Gambino. John Gambino goes as a, what would you say, like an ambassador or something to Sicily to meet with uh, Totorina's people and say, um, we got to figure out something here because Castellano, like, he's related to a lot of these people. And Totorina was smart enough to recognize that it's fine if you want to kill everybody in Palermo, but you, 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 ha- you need New York. You, you need to maintain positive relations with New York. So they, they worked out a deal where um, Totorina allowed some of those members of that super clan to migrate to the United States as long as they would never set foot in uh, Sicily again. But it's complicated because there were some people that Totorina said, even to Paul Castellano, he said, no exception. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of them that, I, that, that for this deal to, to be go through, I want them dead. And so it just shows you how treacherous this world is. The Cherry Hill Gambinos basically had to kill a couple of their own relatives right. in in Jersey. 
Right. Um, which, um, this was on Bruno's territory, and I, I think in one case, they even used Bruno shooters, didn't they? Yeah, For well, what? there was a situation with the um, the two brothers. God, I, my, my, my... Selena brother? The Selena brothers. Yeah. Uh, who were uh, Terry Hill Gambino's crew members yeah. who got too big for their britches. And according to informants, uh, Uncle Joe Legambi and Yogi Merlino right, right. were involved in those murders. They were charged. The Eventually those charges were dropped. But uh, at the time, it, it looked like Nicky Scarfo was giving... The Cherry Hill Gambino, Nicky Scarfo was Angelo Bruno's uh, one of his successors, was giving the Cherry Hill Gambinos uh, shooters, right, right. And, and in order for these guys to get their bones, and and Uncle Joe Legambi went on to become a boss of the Philadelphia Mafia. He stabilized that family in the late nineties and two thousands. He's now the kind of de facto uh, consigliere, and um, Yogi Merlino's the boss of the Philadelphia ma- Mafia. Joey Merlino's uncle who eventually turned government for me. And the and the, the Selena brothers that that's a gets pretty tangled because that because which Merlino was the one that became the Chucky. Was that Yogi? No, or, 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 Yogi became the informant. Yogi Chucky was the underboss. Yogi claimed that the Selena brothers were that that was an internal thing between the Cherry Hill Gambinos and them over over money. So was that related to the politics going on in Sicily? I, I don't know. But we know that around that same time, Pietro and Zarillo is found um, in a trunk in 1982. And then Antonino and uh, Zarillo goes missing around the same time. And those were agreements that... And the, Selena Brothers was 83. Yeah, it might have been 82 or 83. I can't remember. Um, but... Those were agreements that basically the Cherry Hill Gambinos had to concede. Um, so it, it's really, it's really tragic because these are their own their own relatives. So let's, so. let's trace Menino um, into this group now. So Lorenzo Menino again. I don't know why I didn't realize that Frankie Boy Cali and Lorenzo Menino, who were kind of a a, a duo, a tandem, if you will. Um, they rose through the ranks together yeah. uh, in, in the 90s and 2000s to the point where they were in the administration in the 2010s. Uh, Menino. Well, I'm sorry. Let me just interrupt you for yeah. a second. I apologize. What's interesting about, because Frankie Kelly, I think is sort of like a, for people that follow this is a, Everyone knows who that is. Frankie Look, Boy Cali, for people that might not know, became the boss or the at least the acting boss or street boss of the Gambinos, um, was... You know, he was the golden boy in, in the New York Mafia. Yeah, younger guy. Yeah, and then he got murdered about four, four or five years ago in a very strange, non-mafia related, uh, some mentally ill right winger that was dating his niece or had maybe had been infatuated with his niece, who lived with him and his wife. He thought Sh- Kelly was part of some like human yeah. trafficking. Uh, yeah. Some he conspiracy. thought he was making a citizen's arrest, <laughs> right. and he showed up at right. the guy's house and lured, lured him out of his house um, under the pretense that there had been a car accident, and then shot him in the back. Yeah, that, that was that was pretty. I mean, I, I can't think of any parallel example and at the of time, that in organized crime history. At the time, and Jimmy and I, this was right before we. I think we, as we were starting the OG Pod. Um, but I remember talking to Jimmy right when this was happening and there was a lot of speculation that this was the Gotti's coming, the Gotti faction of the family coming after the Sicilians. Right. And it was going to be the start of a civil war. It, it, it happened around the same time that Gene Gotti had came out of prison who was John Gotti's uh, most trusted brother. Yeah. And everyone was speculating there was, and that wasn't what the case was. No, well, it turned out to not be the case, but be, because, because Callie was more of um make, I think was more of the, you know, on, uh, in the newspapers. What I think is interesting about Menino is, and, and, and we think of his fortunes being tied to Callie, but Lorenzo Menino was on people's radars way before, before Frankie, Frankie Boy Cali. because yeah. Lorenzo Menino, we, 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 you know, I have government documents here spread out in front of me that talk about Lorenzo Menino being Joe Gambino's quote right hand man as early as the 1980s. The Joe Gambino or John? Joe. Joe. Okay. Joe. 
be, because at that point, John's higher. Right. Lorenzo would have been too young to be that close to to John at that point. So um, I think it's just interesting that um, we think of Menino as sort of like the successor to Cali, but actually Menino's ties go back just as just as deep and just as far, if that makes sense. Right. And they allegedly all report to Italian Dom Sifalu. Yes. Who's supposedly the kind of the faker head. Who yeah. lets the younger younger Sicilians, when I say younger, Lorenzo Menino is 80, or sorry, he's 64. He's not that young. Yeah, and it, uh, it'd be interesting to ask some of our Gambino people that we know uh, for more details, but again, that speculation that, oh, this must be the Gotti faction going after Frankie Cali, that, that speculation at first. But but when you realize, when you look through the documentation and, and you talk to other people, actually, they, they have pretty good terms. They have pretty good, they have, actually have pretty good relations with each other, Yeah, the Gotti people and the Sicilians. So in a way, and I admit, I, di I didn't see that at the time. But with hindsight, we, sh we could have said like, "Well, that actually doesn't make sense <laughs> because there, there actually there isn't really this tension between between the two groups, at least not that I can tell." So Menino made his bones and got his button uh, in 1988. Um, was sponsored by I think it was like a, <laughs> a coalition of the Cherry Hill Gambinos and uh, Sammy the Bull. Um, who oversaw the murder that Lorenzo Menino participated in to earn him entry into the Gambino crime family. And I just want to, you know, discuss that for maybe uh, uh, five minutes, 10 minutes as we, as we start to kind of wind down here, um, because it's, it's pretty compelling. Uh, it was a murder that was sought for a green light by John Gambino, the, the kind of the, First among, e first among equals of those brothers uh, as the uh, leader of the Cherry Hill Gambinos. And you had a situation in early 1988 where you had, it might have been a, been a distant cousin of theirs, I'm not sure. The guy's name was Giuseppe Gambino. And he lived um, in the same apartment complex in Astoria, Queens, as a guy named uh, Frank uh, Francesco Oliveri, who was a Sicilian immigrant who worked at the Ronzani Pasta Factory, um, and was, according to informants, this was never charged. And I'm, I'm not trying to uh, smudge a man's reputation when he when he's been dead for 35 years, but uh, Mr. Oliveri was alleged to have been involved in drug dealing with the Cherry Hill Gambinos. Specifically, this cousin of the Gambinos, uh, maybe I'm using the term loosely, but Giuseppe Gambino, who yeah. isn't the same Not Joe, Joe yeah, Gambino right. who we're talking about as being the, the mentor of, of Lorenzo Menino. So one of the Cherry Hill Gambinos lives in this apartment complex in Queens with the, the Sicilian immigrant uh, Francisco um, Oliveri, who lives there with his wife and five kids, he speaks kind of broken English um, and is supplementing his income at the pasta factory, allegedly with uh, dabbling in drug deals. One of these drug deals goes wrong um, and a feud develops between the neighbors. And in February of 1988, Francesco Oliveri stomps Giuseppe Gambino to death, beats and stomps him to death in the apartment complex. Um, this gets a murder contract placed on Francisco Oliveri's head. John Gambino is adamant that he is made an example of. He travels to both uh, Ozone Park, uh, to the Bergen Fish and Hunt Club, as well as the Ravenite to discuss this with John Gotti and Sammy Gravano. And it's decided in April that they are going to carry out the hit. And Gotti himself puts together the hit team. Um, which I found which I found very <laughs> Yeah, boss. <laughs> compelling again. Yeah. Like I, You're supposed but, to delegate those things. Right. John. <laughs> so um 
John Gambino of the of the Cherry Hills wants Lorenzo Menino on the hit so he can propose him for his button. Joe Gambino, who is Lorenzo Menino's mentor, is also on the hit. Sammy the Bull's gonna be there. And then Gotti recommends a uh, uh a New Jersey Gambino soldier by the name of uh, Bobby Cabert. I'm not sure how you pronounce the last name, Jimmy. Can you pronounce it? I don't want to butcher it. Oh yeah, um, Bisasha. So I, Robert Bisasha was known on the. I, I think I, I, was known on the streets as Bobby Cabert, and he got the name Cabert because he was a world class softball player, and he would throw a lot of strikeouts. So instead of calling him Robert, they called him Cabert. It became a nickname, um, and he was someone that was known as a shooter, as as a guy that was known as a a. a Someone who paints houses. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! And uh, don't bring that up. Uh, I'm joking, but, but known as a guy that was uh, was capable, and uh, was someone that had had murdered before, and was already a made member, and this was for Bobby Cabert to become a capo. This was going to get him promoted, and then a guy named o uh, another potential soldier who became a soldier, Orazio Stantini, uh, went by the nickname Ozzy. And Ozzy Stantini was brought into it by Gravano because Gravano wanted Stantino to get his, Stantini to get his button. Yeah, so each guy, had, John Gambino, Gravano, Gotti, have their own guys right. that they're right. And but they, none of them, I guess, I shouldn't say I don't know if they knew or they didn't know. But Bobby Caber really had nothing to do with this. It was simply inserted at Gotti's request because mm -hmm. he trusted right. Caber to be the trigger man. Um, and this conspiracy went on for a good month uh, of planning, and there were actually uh, tactical meetings that were taking place at the Raven Night. Yeah, uh, in in Little Italy, uh, the night before, there were two attempts made on Oliveri's life. One attempt was unsuccessful on April twenty sixth, and on that night, uh, the whole hit team met at the Ravenite with Gravano and Gotti. And then they, they discovered that Oliveri lived, well, they knew he lived at this apartment complex and they, they were able to be tipped off that he had a parking permit that switched sides of the street in the morning. So where he parked at night, he parked on uh, one side of the street from seven o'clock at night to seven o'clock in the morning. When it became seven o'clock in the morning, he had to move his car to the other side of the street. So they knew that every morning at about seven o'clock, he would leave to go move his car. It was an Al a, a white Alfa Romeo. Um, he was staying true to his roots. Yeah, uh, Boy, for a guy who works at the Ranzoni plant, <laughs> it's a nice car for. So they show up on uh, on the morning of April twenty sixth, and they missed him. They missed him by like 10 minutes. He had already moved the car. Um, they show back up um, a week later. I believe it was May 1st or 2nd. And uh, they're, they're in two different cars. Gravano is on, is on site with Menino. Menino provides the murder weapon uh, to Bobby Cabert. And Bobby Cabert uh, successfully guns down Oliveri as he's going to move his car that morning. Um, the case or that murder gets rolled in to a drug racketeering case that's brought in 1993. Uh, there's a trial that ends in a hung jury. And instead of going back to trial, Menino pleads it out, admits to his role in the Oliveri murder as a predicate act um, to the racketeering conviction and ends up doing about 12 years in prison, walks out in 94. Uh, or sorry, walks out in 04. Went in in, in like 91 or 92. And it shows you, this case study shows you the importance of being a made guy because the Cherry Hill Gambia, and by the way, we I don't know if we clarified this, I can't remember, but Cherry Hill is a city in, 
South Jersey. That's we said, what, that's why we keep on but, saying. But we also said that it's more of a, or it's not more of a, it is a suburb of Philadelphia. Yeah, it's not yeah. part of the New York, no, New it's, Jersey. It's, it's about five miles from Philadelphia. Yeah. It's right, 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 right there. But that's why we say Cherry Hill Gambinos. Yeah. And at one point, actually, a lot of those guys actually did move back to New York. But we, it's we still call them the Cherry Hill Gambinos because it just I don't know. I think it has a cool <laughs> it has a cool ring to it. But anyhow, um, the Cherry Hill Gambinos. And I think we've talked about this a little bit in some other episodes, maybe Philly episodes. The Cherry Hill Gambinos had dust ups with guys in the Bruno Scarfo family, but no one gets whacked because you're both made they're both made guys. And so you have there were some sit downs. One of them happened with Castellano when he was still boss. One of them when Gotti was boss. But I'm saying Oliveri. He's got no. He's. Got, I mean, the guys that he would run to were the guys that he had a beef with, right? right. So he's just. They're just going to whack yeah. him. So it shows you the importance of in that world having the right connections or or even you know having membership because if you're not sponsored by anyone or protected by anyone, um, and you get on the wrong side of a made guy, your days are probably numbered. And at least uh, back then, so Menino provided Bobby Caber with the gun um, that killed. Francesco Oliveri, but he also provided the cars that were used in the hit. And one of the ways they were able to tie Menino to the hit was that they had uh, phone records from his car phone. And it's funny to think of what a car phone looked like in 1988. Yeah, it was you know the size of uh, the the Rock of Gibraltar. <laughs> um, that he they had phone calls from him to the uh, auto dealership where he was renting the car, uh, uh, renting the cars from. Um, so he, he was part of the logistics. Yes. And he was there. And he was there. Yeah. He was on scene and they had walkie talkies. They were communicating. Right. He provided the walkie talkies as well. Uh, so how did this case get solved? Well, Sammy the Bull Gravano flipped in, in 1991 and, uh, spilled the beans on, on what happened in the, in the Francesco Alvary murder as well as another, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 hits. But that's the that was the hit that did Lorenzo Menino in. He got his button though, I believe, in the fall of '88. Um, he was in that same. I don't know if it was the exact same induction class, but it was in the same couple of months that John Gotti Jr. got made. Because I know that John Gotti Jr. Um, and Mikey Scars were both made in a Christmas Eve 1988 ceremony. What do you think? It, what do you think of this says about like one thing that's curious? Um, I find curious is so Lorenzo is able to he makes a he, he pleads out right. John and Joe do the same thing for the cocaine and heroin conspiracy. They actually went on the lam for a while. Mm-hmm. They got caught in Florida. Um, old school rules. It doesn't apply now. Every everyone pleads out now, but the old school rules were. You're never supposed to take a plea. You never acknowledge. I mean, the chair, John and Joe basically admitted that they were members of the mafia involved in drug trafficking to get a lesser well, sentence. They didn't snitch on anyone, but I'm saying they, they admitted in court that they were part of this criminal conspiracy. You're not supposed to, you, in the old school ways, you were not supposed well, to do that. Well, especially in the Gotti regime, or at yes, least the right. early right. Gotti era, when John Gotti himself was on the street, or in the first couple of years when he was behind bars and he still, still had some, some, uh, uh, some, some shot calling authority. But uh, he was adamant yes. that nobody take pleas. Right. So, like you're pointing out, this... Happened in 1994. Now, Gotti had only been in prison for three years. You would think that Gotti at that point still had some sway in decision making. His son was running the family. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't seem to apply to the two Gambino brothers or Lorenzo Menino. Right. So what do you think that's is, is that was there, uh, there could be two things. And let's see what you think about this. Either a. Because Gotti's in prison, he's his his reach is already starting to, yes. you know, it's not as it doesn't reach as far. And then also because the the sometimes the the zip factions seem to have their own right kind I think of it, I think it's rules both. and norms that I think apply. it's both. And I think, uh, like I said earlier, when we were introducing the Cherry Hill Gambinos as an entity, they were a part of the Gambino organization, but they were kind of a island in its own right yeah where they kind of govern themselves to a degree and and john gambino even rose to the point in the 
uh, 2000s and 2010s before he died. I think he died about four, four, three, four, five years ago. Yeah, not long ago. Uh, he was on the uh, on the ruling board, so he was one of the the guys that was actually running the whole Gambian organization, not just the Cherry Hill Group. Yeah, and um, and, and you want to talk about another um, uh, cross connection here? I'm talking about the Selena brothers and Uncle Joe Legambi being the alleged one of the the trigger man on one of the Selena brothers hits. Joe Legambi was caught famously on a wire in 2010 and 11 oh, having yeah. dinner, having a lunch meeting with John Gambino. Yeah. Um, to so discuss family business between Philadelphia and the Gambinos. And they met at a place called La Grilla in New Jersey. And it was a, a four hour meeting that they had a, the whole thing taped. Well, and, it's uh, interesting that the Cherry Hill Gambinos to show you how they're always able to weather these storms because they're related to Paul Castellano. And when Gotti has Castellano killed, Gotti has to make sure with the Cherry Hill Gambinos, like, are we no, good now? No are we good now? Gonna, yeah, are we good? Because <laughs> that's your, I know that's your relative. And and they they worked it out. And they knew and, it was good for business. Yeah. And then you have a similar thing with, with Bruno to Scarfo. Like, it doesn't, it does like, there's, st- and then to later on to Marley, they're always keeping these good yeah. relationships but when th- possible. Think about, though, from the, from the Gambino administration in the post Castellano era. You were okay with drug dealing. Oh, yeah. John Gotti was a drug dealer. Yeah. So you're probably more prone to yeah. you know, bestow leniency on yeah. this drug dealing crew without, you know, yeah. that, that even though Castellano was looking the other way, yeah. It still had to be something that was of course kind of known about but not spoken about. Yeah. Because publicly he still had this yeah. no drug. I mean, and that's really what was the crux of the Castellano Gotti beef. I mean, it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, and there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of other issues at play that were leading up to that. But what things came to a head was because Gotti knew that Castellano was going to get a hold of those wiretap tapes, and it was going to show that Gotti Gotti was fully aware of a giant heroin. uh, Yeah organization within his crew quack quack <laughs> with his best friend Ruggiero Angelo Ruggiero with his brother uh, Gene Gotti mm-hmm. and they were moving huge amounts of H right. and Castellano was very very vocal about if I find out that you knew what was going on I'm going to kill you and I'm going to kill your brother yeah and it, there's a lot of hypocrisy there just like Bruno right, because he was taking drug money he knew the same guys that Bruno was taking drug money from so was Castellano yeah. and I think there was always this kind of um thing of Castellano and Bruno trusting the Sicilian guys to traffic heroin and not get in trouble and get pinched, but they didn't trust guys like well, Quack Quack. I, who, I, would who say, I, would tr- I would trust John Gambino <laughs> before I would trust Angie right. Ruggiero you know, right. seven times in a week, yeah, twice right. on Sundays. So it sort of makes sense, right? <laughs> and Andy, and for, for people that are interested in little you know tidbits and, and little... Um, Interesting uh, anecdotes. Andy Ruggiero, who was John Gotti's best friend, they called him Quack Quack because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. He thought he was being slick and having all these conversations about drug dealing on his 14-year-old daughter's, like, uh, My Little Pony phone. (laughs) It was like a pink phone and, like, the... uh, Like, like, literally, like it was, like, shaped like a a horse or a unicorn. (laughs) And it was in, she had her own line, and think about this: in like nineteen eighty two, eighty three, a, yeah. a fourteen year old having their own That's line in their bedroom that was pretty <laughs> extravagant. Right. And and Angie Ruggiero thought that you know they might have a bug on my home phone, but they're not going to have a bug on my fourteen year old daughter's phone. Right. Well, yeah, unless there's someone that you're dealing with who's a snitch that knows that you're using your fourteen <laughs> year old daughter's phone, and they're going to tip the government off, and they're going to put a bug on that phone. Yeah, and he was very. He would talk very openly, right? And that, that those were the wiretaps that Castellano was desperately trying to get his hands on. That the Gotti crew was desperately trying to prevent him from getting his hands on, because not only were they talking about drug dealing, as you just said, they were talking very loose lipped about how much they disliked Paul Castellano, <laughs> right? Right. And they were making disparaging remarks about his sexual proclivities. Oh yes, and the fact that he was cheating on Carlo Gambino's sister with the the Hispanic 
uh, the maid. maid yeah. And how he was going to Florida to get penile enlargement su- surgery. Oh yeah, they were dishing. They were yeah. dishing in those in those in those tapes. And uh, so yeah, and and uh, but it's really interesting. I mean, you could just go on and on. We, we're running out of time here. But the Cherry Hill Gambinos, we didn't even get to. They're also at the center of that um, Vatican Bank scandal. The like pizza in the pizza the connection, pizza connection, right? So they're they're really interesting. They're not only touching upon Philly, New York, but but international stuff. So so it's interesting that even today, guys like Lorenzo Menino and um, Giovanni uh, Enzarillo, who was a made guy with the Gambinos, but he's now in, back in Palermo, and I and just not long ago, uh, Tommaso Gambino was busted in yeah, Sicily two years ago, and that's that's. Joe's son, right. I believe. Yeah, so it's, Tommy's bro- it's Tommy's brother. No, no, it's Tommy's, Tommy's first cousin. Tommy's first is Rosario. Primo Cugino. Okay, because uh, Tommy's father is Rosario, who also was arrested not that yeah. long ago after being deported in, from the United States in Sicily. Yeah, and so even now, even though like John's dead and Frankie Kelly's dead, they're, they're still they're still making headlines. If you believe the scuttlebutt, Tommy Gambino leads what's left of the L.A. Mafia. He's a guy that. Um, is you know out and about. He's not hard to find in L.A. He rubs elbows with some Hollywood celebrities yeah. and, and Hollywood elites, and um, you know who knows. There and I reported uh, in the last year or two that uh, he had, he was making people at the request of um, Buffalo. So, yeah, there were some Canadian guys. Yeah, and some Canadian guys yeah. that were, were getting made so they could do business on behalf of the Tadaros and that they had reached out to Tommy Gambino in L.A. We're going to send this guy over to you to make them. And then one of these guys comes back after getting made. He takes his family on a Disney Disneyland trip. This is according to the informant. We don't know this for a fact, but an, uh, one or two informants, at least one informant, tells the government that this Al Ivoroni guy goes to L.A. with his family to take his kids to Disneyland. He takes off in the middle of the family trip to go meet up with Tommy Gambino who makes him. Um, and then, you know, a week later when he gets back to Buffalo or I don't know, I don't remember if it was in Buffalo or if it was in Hamilton, which is the, uh, I think he was Ham- a Hamilton, Hamilton, guy. Ontario. When he gets back to Hamilton, which is right next to Buffalo, yeah, yeah. like you could live in Hamilton and work in Buffalo, or you could work in Buffalo and live in right. Hamilton. Uh, and yeah, he, he, a week or two when he get a week or two after he gets home from that trip to California, he's murdered. Yeah. So even even now, um, you you there are these uh, you still hear about um, the uh, people part of this mafia super clan. I'm in the and the and the and the. Um, my understanding is the the Enzarillos are still um, major powers in Palermo, especially now that Totorina's dead and Provenzano's dead, and all those guys, most of those guys well, Fra- that hated them are gone. Frankie Boy Cal- Frankie Boy Cali's brother in law was Tall Pete Enzarillo, who's who's a captain in the Gambinos, Gambinos now. Yeah. Right. I know we're throwing a lot of names at you people, and if we, if Jimmy and I have a hard time keeping <laughs> them straight, we can imagine uh, that you yeah. guys are swimming. But uh, we thought we think we got we got to the the meat and potatoes of of Lorenzo Menino and where the the Gambino crime family stands right now. That the Sicilian uh, group within that organization, you know, they're the ones that are the the straws that stir the drink right now. And you know, last thing I'll say about Lorenzo Menino is, you know, I, I did some due diligence over the last couple of weeks and and reached out to some. FBI sources that I that I have and and some some wise guys that are have dealt with him and uh, Lorenzo Menino is as Jerry Capace said in his in his original column that that broached the subject he's the real deal That's and he's a I guy understand. that has uh, universal respect um, he is someone that is very business savvy very sharp uh, is respected on the street. He's respected in the boardroom. Mm-hmm. He's a guy that gets Both along. Both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, check, as we say, checks a lot of boxes, um, doesn't have any, at least what we know, doesn't really have any enemies. No one dislikes him. Uh, from what I heard from one of these um, feds that uh, after Frankie Boy Cali died, it wasn't, nobody blinked. Uh, it was just next man up and next man up is Lorenzo. And you just went from the acting consigliere to the acting boss and and uh, Mikey Boy Paradiso allegedly uh, has taken over as as conciliary the last couple of years. Mickey Boy is it Mickey Boy or Mikey Boy? Uh, Michael Paradiso. Yeah, 
So that's where we stand. Um, this was fun. Yeah, hopefully we'll do some more East Coast uh, LCN um, episodes soon. We know they're popular. Uh, we like to uh, have diversity and look at other crime families, but uh, there's still a lot of action on the East Coast, so we'll 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 continue to cover. Yeah, it. I'm going to make a more concentrated effort on on bringing more New York LCN um, into into the OG Pod as well as Gangster Report because you know you, you can't really cover the mafia in America without. <laughs> at least having a a focus uh, of some degree on on New York City, the Big Apple. Yeah, that's that's the nexus of all this. So, anyhow, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, please again spread the word, follow us, like us, and uh, on social media. And we'll see you next week. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. We're out. <laughs>